So my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm, I lead the Heart and Vascular Center. I'm a vascular surgeon uh, by trade, and I also now have the responsibility of running MITEI. And so many of these are different projects that are, are being built in MITEI, which we think will be of some interest to you. It's fascinating listening uh, to what Dr. Bettigrew and Dr. Schwartz were talking about. And so here's my take on it. They're kind of like the senior level CEOs who create an environment that allow people like me to play. But at the end of the day, it's going to depend upon the middle level managers, people like me, people like Tim, to actually make this work. And if we don't make it work, it is a problem for us. It's our, we, they've given us a ball to run with. And if we don't execute on it, then it becomes our problem. Now let me tell you why, why this is important, is that and what's really good is you're all about to become physicians. You're about to enter my world. I have multiple masters on a daily basis, but the ultimate master is your patient. I can't, when the patient calls me, say, well, I got a meeting with Roberta Schwartz today or a meeting with Tim Boone today. You have to answer that call. When the emergencies arise, same thing. Can't go say, well, you know, I'm supposed to go see Dr. Mark Boom. I got to call Dr. Mark Boom and say, hey, Mark, I'm sorry, I can't turn up to that meeting because I got to go. This patient's bleeding from their groin or something like that. And what I mean by that is that it is often interpreted that the physicians are not interested. Why? Because they're late for your meetings or they cancel your meetings at the last minute. The good thing is that you're about to become ambassadors. You're going to enter that world, and you're going to understand what that master is. And the ultimate master is clinical care. So what I'd say to you as you start this journey with us is don't interpret that as lack of interest. I can tell you that on the clinical faculty staff over at Methodist, there is huge interest in being surrounded with people like you. Rod mentioned that I started Pumps and Pipes. And so Pumps and Pipes is a very interesting meeting because of the people who we put in that audience. And the people that are in that audience are physicians like me. Uh, there are engineers from oil and gas. There's engineers from NASA. We speak a different language. And one of the things is, this is and what you're about to see, this is an exercise in communication. And those students who come out of an engineering background, then train in medicine, are almost going to be like what you see you know, at the UN. You're the people who can translate. And that is fundamentally important. Because I always say that when we speak a different language, and when an engineer stands up and presents at Pumps and Pipes, oh, I can't understand a word that's been up there. That is a lost opportunity. And, and we all have to understand that when we talk to one another, there's got to be a sweet point where we can intersect and understand one another. And if you look at it in a different dimension, you still miss. And it takes a while in seniority before you go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I know what you're saying is important, but I don't understand it. And so the art is to boil this down and to, to be able to translate in a mechanism that the engineers can understand what the clinical problem is, the clinical, problem, the clinical people understand what the engineers bring to it. And when we stand up at Pumps and Pipes and we express a clinical problem, you see the light bulbs going on, boom, boom, boom. The engineer suddenly realizes that they know how to solve that problem. I don't know how to solve the problem. They know how to solve that problem. And once you and I will take for granted taking care of patients on a daily basis. That's what we do. It is a privilege that the majority of the world doesn't have. And when you take somebody in engineering who has not had that opportunity, you've got a hook because they want to do things that are meaningful and they want to do things that impact other people. Clearly, oil and gas does that, but not as directly as you and I do. And so, so that's my pitch about as give us, have a little bit of patience with the clinicians. It's not that they're not interested in what you're doing. They are fundamentally interested in what, what you do. And I can tell you that NMED is probably the single most exciting project that's happened around Methodist since I've been there. And I describe Methodist as a 100-year-old startup. Okay, now what do I mean by that? When I came down here, I was employed by Baylor. Tim Boone was employed by Baylor. We're not going to go into what happened, but the bottom line is it came apart. And overnight, no medical students, no residents, no I'd never worked without a resident or a fellow in my entire academic career. I was like lost. I barely knew how to do an itch and pee, couldn't fill out the chart. And so what happened was it had to be built from the ground up. And that's the story of Methodist, and this is why it's exciting, because I used to say, we've had 1,000 new faculty, we've built 30 departments, we started 50 training programs. And they'd say, but do you have a medical school? I said, we don't have a medical school. 
and now we've got a medical school. And so we see this as completing this pie. The cake has been rebaked, but now we've got to put the icing on the cake. And you're an incredibly important part of that icing in evolving what we're going to, uh, what we're going to be doing going forward. So don't think of NMED as us and Methodist as them. We are all you. And I think the middle level people, it's our job to try and figure out how we connect that. Dr. Pettigrew talked about collisions. And that's true. I mean, and you'll see one of the slides I've got talks about you know, proximity as productivity, and this is very true. So we often think that we in invent things. The reason that I came down to Houston was because of Dr. DeBakey. And um, it's funny, we're just talking to, uh, to John. He didn't, he didn't patent anything. You know, everything's called DeBakey, but he didn't have patent anything. He didn't have any IP. Now, we're not advertising that as being the method going forward, but he just did it. And so what we want to do basically is partner with you and try and do this right. So if you look, Dr. DeBakey in the background, and I said, we have created one of the things we're going to talk about is DeBakey education. We think it's great because we've got cameras in the operating room, we've got remote training. Well, this is a picture that was taken something like 30 years ago. And if you look up above him, there's a guy, a little intrusive, but you see on that TV uh, camera, he's hanging up right over the operating room field. And if you look up above, right at the top of that, there's people standing up there watching. And they were the first people to broadcast these things. So none of this stuff happens to be new. We just have bigger opportunities to develop it. And Medical Center was built around competition. To the left is Dr. DeBakey's operating room. To the right is Dr. Cooley's operating room. And so they always abide even for the number of people who could be in there watching, watching these kids. I'm not sure to the guy on the right at the back exactly how much he was learning at that particular point in time. But I wanted to, so what we've done is one of the things that is very distinctive about Methodist is that we have coalesced everything and now you into essentially one campus. And that is fundamentally important. And so the Walter Tower basically is part really of that. I'm an academic surgeon. Do I have a research lab? Sort of. Do I have endothelial cells and, and test tubes? No. Nope. But what we do basically, this is our research lab. This is where we work basically on a daily basis. And this is where the translation part of this is actually going to occur. This is my operating room. That little green thing is now the camera. We don't have a guy in a boom hanging up above the field anymore. And we don't need to have viewing domes because we can transmit it and we can record it and we can integrate a lot of the different components of um, what we're doing. You see that arm moving around it. We have this fundamental relationship with Siemens. We are probably the best cardiovascular imaging that exists in the world. And this is another piece that we actually bring really to the table. It allows us to transmit these things. This is doing live cases. You could be sitting here watching cases. And that's another component of this, is that you innovate and you start to create things and you need to understand, you know, how do we put basically that device in through a laparoscopic port? We have the ability to either let you walk over there and watch this and talk to the clinicians, or we have the ability to tr let you watch these things remotely. And as these new towers go up, everything is integrated from an audiovisual standpoint. So let's listen to Dr. DeBakey for one minute. Let's see if I can plug this in. And we did the first. Carotid endarterectomy here in this hospital in 1953. Can you hear that? We did the first uh, coronary bypass here Back. in 1964. So he's talking about so a series of firsts. It's maxed out. Of he's talking about a series of firsts. Carotid endarterectomy, coronary bypass. And, these are the, and this would, so Dacron, to this date, Dacron is the material that is used to replace the Yora. How did that come to be? It came to be because he went to you know, defunct department store in downtown Houston. He was looking for a, a material called Vignon End that had been used um, by other surgeons to replace the aorta. And the, in Foley's in the drapery department, the uh, sales clerk said, sorry, Dr. DeBakey, we're out of Vignon End. We've got some new stuff that just came in. It's called polyester, Dacron. What do you think of that? And he looked at it, and he said, yeah, that might work. And so he took it home. He sewed it into a tube on his wife's sewing machine. Um, one presentation, I said, did you get IRB approval, Dr. DeBake? He says, oh, absolutely. I was the IRB. I said it was OK. So things have changed a little bit. It's not quite that easy. And the next day, he implanted it. And to this date, that is how we replaced the order. No patents, no IP, just a vision really for trying to help patients. And so it occurred. And so 
The way I sell our campus space is, is, is the following. Is to your right in that tower is what I believe is the most advanced cardiovascular clinical care tower and neurological care tower in the world. It is immediately adjacent to the most advanced uh, training lab. Training equals development. Everything that we put into that training lab can be used for device testing and product development. It is overlaid by the world's most advanced imaging uh, and cardiovascular imaging, neurological imaging, because of this partner with Siemens. We have on-site Siemens research scientists, and the entire thing is integrated from an audiovisual standpoint. We record what we do in an operating room every day. If you've not looked at our YouTube channel, the Bakey CV YouTube channel, you should look at it. And we are now expanding that into the other centers of excellence facing around the organization. Proximity equals productivity. I wish this was immediately adjacent, but it's pretty close. And the good news is the students are going to be rotating with us. Because as you'll see, you know, increasing the, the facility of interacting with one another basically is fundamentally important to what we're doing. How many of you have been in Mighty? Mm -hmm. Almost everybody. Well, who's not been in Mighty? All right, nobody. So I'm just going to skip through this. This was a tour through Mighty. I just want to make sure that you're all basically aware of what's going on there. So Mighty was the vision of Dr. Barbara Bass. She was the initial chair of general surgery. And again, this hospital took on building one of the biggest training centers in the United States with a vision uh, that it could be used for multiple different things going forwards. And we have we, we see Mighty as a core lab. Just like basically you've got all these, these uh, maker bots you know, around here. Think of Mighty as, as my laboratory. The OR is our laboratory. These are places that we can take ideas from the pre We can do all of this testing on one site. Our surgeons can still be operating and generating revenue, and they can drop over to Mighty between time and hang out and discuss basically what the products are that you're creating. That's the beauty of what has been created here. It's not mine. It's yours. And that's what we need to figure out is how we change this mindset. And, and as you start coming through in your clinical rotations, I think you'll be less intimidated you know, by the clinicians who are there. You'll see us with all the warts and faults that we actually have. Um, and, and we are very excited uh, to be able to engage with you. And so there's a number of different ways in which we are trying to increase internal utilization of this at the same time as going to bring people from outside. And so what we call the Centers of Excellence, Methods of Baker Horton Vascular Center, Center of Excellence, uh, Orthopedics, the Center of Excellence, Transplant, and other centers. We, we focus these basically around service lines. Because one of the challenges in innovation is how we have broken it into different commodities. We were just talking earlier, is stroke. Who treats stroke? Well, we traditionally think of stroke as being in the Neurological Institute. OK? Not really. In the Heart and Vascular Center, we cause more strokes, and we prevent more strokes than anybody in neuro does. Neuro engages when the stroke occurs and treats it. So if you're going to address that, we need a whole different thought process of how do we put the people, not who are neurosurgeons, but who are people who are involved in treatment of stroke. That's how you're going to change this paradigm, basically, as we move forward. And we are basically in the process of doing this. So let me give you an example. So the huge revolution in, in the heart and vascular world has been TAVR, transarterial replacement of an aortic valve. Okay, up until 10 years ago, the only way you did this was by opening your chest, putting you on cardiopulmonary bypass, and replacing uh, the aortic valve. It is a very effective uh, tool for doing that. So why would you take on something that is very effective, not a lot of mortality, to replace it with something else? Because people don't like surgery. We hate to say that as a group of surgeons, but that's the fact. And so along comes a crazy guy and says, well, I can take one of those stent things that's been created by Julio Palmas. Palmas stent is a balloon expandable stent. Julio Palmas was a radiologist in San Antonio. First time I heard about Putting a stent in an artery, I thought it was the most ludicrous thing I'd ever heard in my life. So if I think it's stupid, you should put your money in it because it's probably going to be right. But nobody had ever actually done that before. And then another guy said, well, maybe we could put a valve in the inside of this and use that to deliver a new valve into the order. Crazy stuff, but it was done. 
And that really has transformed it. We did not get involved in the first of those clinical trials. We did get involved in the second trial. And this is where research, innovation, and the importance of us of being on the cutting edge of innovation is that our group were the top enrollers in that clinical trial. What that basically does is produce visibility. Visibility and in industry. Industry is very important. They are not the evil empire. Most in US medical device innovation changes the world. And so we need to be able to figure out how we partner with them, and we did. And so what that then led to is these two guys in the bottom left-hand corner, Mike Reardon and Neil Kleiman, became the principal investigators in the biggest trial that was ever run. What that means is they have controlled the data. What that means is that when the data is consolidated, they present the data. And what that means is because you get five New England Journal publications out of it. We can't buy that kind of marketing exposure. And so we, we, we fight for access to innovative clinical trials as we move forward. Then it gets approved. Now you've got to train the world. And guess who's got the best training center? And guess where the Medtronics and the Edwards have seen what we have as they've come down and supported the, they've seen Mighty. And they basically move all the training down there. And those are all financially lucrative for us as we go down that line. And that's the entire circle. Okay, we're involved in the trial. We use that to drive patients towards us. We do a good job enrolling the trial, FDA approval. Then we move into training mode. And we want to be the trainers. A lot of people say, well, why would you want to train your competition? Because they're going to get trained. And it's much better that they come to Methodist for, to meet somebody like me. Because then I have a relationship with them. And guess where they're going to You lose a little because they take all the easy cases. You gain a lot. because and, and, and for a reputation standpoint, it's extremely important. What we're not good at is figuring out that, the revenue stream of that entire circle because we kind of divide it up into different components as we move forward. There are also huge opportunities to involve people in the community. Uh, with Houston Fire Department, basically the Sheriff's Office. Sometimes you can walk up in the mighty. And before we go through those doors and I'm touring, people go, you never know what you're going to see on the other side of this door. I really don't like it when the ENT guys have a bunch of heads that are, that are sitting out there. It's a little disturbing even for somebody like me. But they'll bring in um, you know, traumatized cadavers and things like that. They fill the whole place with smoke. So it's a remarkable place for not only developing innovative ideas, but processes. And a lot of this space is about process development. Kind of going through this. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, Homer, put up your hand. And so because of this realization that what we have got is this entire continuum of how to develop devices, idea, prototyping, prototype basically into a model. Model is being used for training. That model may be an, an animate model, maybe an inanimate model, or it could be a cadaver. We could put all of these things in there. And then we bring in the imaging, because in my world, imaging is everything. Uh, and so you use the imaging to evaluate that process. Uh, we basically then evaluate the efficacy of that device. And so because of that, we piggybacked and created this idea of the center uh, for a rapid device translation, because we know it's a frustrating process. We're trying to simplify that by having one entry point with Homer. And he can give you multiple examples, basically, of how this has actually worked. Is it perfect? No. Um, but it is a lot better than just trying to figure this thing out, basically, for yourself. And one of the things we're focused on is not only developing the story, but telling the story. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And these are just some of the examples that Homer can follow up with in terms of products that are going this. And again, think of these. This is not just Methodist-based products. We're agnostic from that point of view. You may have nothing to do with Methodist. If you want to use our facilities, obviously, there's a fee for it. Um, and so it, because, again, it's about creating this infrastructure and this persona of Methodist is the place for innovation. We want startup companies that have got nothing to do with us coming through. You know why? Because we're pretty convinced. If we bring you in to do your preclinical uh, talk, you're going to want to talk to our physicians. Our physicians want to be the, the principal investigators on the clinical trials. For us, being first in something is PR gold. We are competing. And again, the, 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 what has been done at Methodist really is that we now compete in the upper echelons of all these hospitals nationwide. Now you say, well, well, haven't you always done that? Remember, this was organization was broken 14, 15 years ago. What has been done at Methodist, has, I don't believe, has ever been done before in a short period of time like this. And then add a medical school such as NMED on top of that. So we are competing to be in the top 20 hospitals in the nation. I want to be in the top 10 heart and vascular centers in the nation. 
that's pretty tough. It's not easy because you know, nobody else is sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Everybody else is, is moving, and they start ahead of us in building that academic infrastructure. But if you look at the speed at which we're moving versus the other organizations, we're going to get there. And you're another part, basically, of being able to, a big part. Now, let me talk a little bit about Can you turn this one up again? So, Dubaki Education is the other concept that we have here. And we built a studio. You may well be wondering and then why I'll, let, I'll, I'll let me talk for myself. <laughs> I'm going to try and address that. We were very fortunate in being given a large grant from the Debakey Foundation, and the mission statement was to create the world's best cardiovascular training environment. And this really spans from MIRI, which we think is the world's best uh, hands-on training center, to the new operating rooms in Walter Tower, where we link uh, real-time education it is overlaid by what we now think is the world's best uh, cardiovascular imaging with the Siemens relationship. But the whole thing is integrated together from an audiovisual standpoint, and Storch are our partners for this. So why do we need AV integration? Well, we need it because we think that the way that medical education is going to be delivered is fundamentally in the process of changing. You really don't have to come down to Houston for us to be able to deliver you a lecture. We think most of that can be pushed up online. We think that if you're going to pay the money, get in an airplane, take time off work, to come down to a place like Mighty and Methodist, then the value in that should be learning as a surgeon, for example, or an interventionist, how to do things with your hands. And that's really where Mighty transcends any of the other training environments. The other reason for coming down here would be to interact directly one-on-one -on -one with the faculty. But in terms of lectures, and increasingly, this ability to interact remotely can be done using that word, particularly remote, remote education. And so what we're trying to do is push our communication system up to more of an online presence. And in that respect, we run one of the biggest YouTube learning sites that exists. Stop there for a minute, because when we made this two years ago, we said 16,000 uh, subscribers. It's now 73,000 subscribers. And so there is a thirst for this information. And we're pushing out all sorts of your cardiovascular content around us. And for a startup company, for example, if they're doing experiments up in Mighty and they don't want to bring in all their engineers from San Francisco, they're completely connected. So you can bring in the two people who are going to do the procedure. They save money by sitting out in San Francisco and they have this direct two-way communication into Mighty. And the same thing can exist basically for if somebody's creating a new heart valve, it kind of starts with understanding how a heart valve's put in. And so we have the ability to let you guys you see, be involved and, and to see all of these different things. We, I'm not, I don't have time to go through all this, but um, we've created uh, podcasts. You know, the YouTube channel basically is huge. And what you're looking at here is remote um, communication. I'll give you an example of this. This is Mike Reardon. And they were doing a new procedure. It's called a reversed lariat. Still don't really understand exactly what that is. Something to do with the mitral valve. And we had a proctor who was supposed to fly down from Emory, um, who was going to proctor them through that first case. But this was during COVID. And Emory said, you're not flying. The patient was in the hospital. The patient is waiting. Um, and I heard Roberta talk about how telehealth got turned on with COVID. I'd been talking to these guys forever about using remote proctoring. I uh, couldn't get Amy's attention. Well, all of a sudden, this is a crisis. It's like, any chance we could do this? When? Tomorrow. What? And so when we turned this on, and that case went ahead, and that's a proctor up in Emory who talked to him. So this ability for remote learning you know, transcends just learning. It also extends basically to product development and training. Now, we'd really want to talk to you. So Mighty, Mighty XR, Stuart's going to be outside showing our extended reality program. A lot of you probably already know this. This is from a talk I gave to a group of vascular surgeons. Oculus Quest basically has changed this because it's now consumer level pricing. Who always got an Oculus Quest, by the way? Oh, not as many as I would have thought that you were a progressive bunch out here. So, all right, so let me. So, Oculus Quest is now Facebook, Meta, whatever you want to call it, 300 bucks. You can be in that environment. It's pretty remarkable, okay? But it's completely immersive. You can't really do surgery, you know, when you're sitting inside that thing. And in the middle uh, is the HoloLens. The HoloLens is a little bit more like a fighter pilot. You can wear this visor, you can see it, you can fly the plane, but you're pulling in information. And you'll see us basically using this in an operating room. And on the right is mixed reality. You can't see out of it, except the two cameras which act as your eyes. So it actually takes this picture, puts it inside, 
it looks like I can see you, but I'm seeing you in that right lane. And it's tethered. Okay, these HoloLens and the Oculus are untethered. Those are self-contained computers you wear on your head. Once you get up to something like Varia, you're really talking about a whole different level uh, of interaction which can take place. And we'll give you examples. So this is the first augmented reality surgical training. Uh, my eyes. I'm in there That's wearing me. one of these Oculus Quest headsets. And the reason Stuart emphasized this, uh, it, it now won by Facebook, that's, that's the user's view, taking the device out. You have to manipulate, position all of these devices. Uh, there are prompts, so it's a unique way of actually training. There are prompts which come up in front of you to say, hey, Dr. Lumsden, you forgot to do this, now you need to go back and do that and how I can actually insert these devices. This is the devices inside that catheter. That catheter is straight on the guide wire. That controller that uh, Stuart was handling it now looks like a hand. And now we're putting that up inside the patient. The x-ray is on. You can see this. And we're going ahead and actually deploy the device. So we see this as having huge applications in medical education. We also see this when we talk about the robotics we've just talked about. So I'm going to go on through this a little bit. And so, again, the innovation that's going to occur in the VR space and how this is going to affect how we practice medicine from an education standpoint, but also a delivery. Now, what you're looking at here is me wearing a whole lens. What we've done is taken the CT scan of that patient who's laying on the table. I'm interested in the order. We can grab the order out of the CT scan that Siemens created, and I kind of walk with it into the operating room. Patients laying there, stick it on top of them. We can fuse them together. And now I can see inside the patient, and I can make a decision about where to make the incision. It's image-guided therapy, you know, and it's utmost because we're overlaying these things. We're not using any fluoro, and we can minimize and target the incisions a little bit better. That's one way this can be applied. Uh, Vario is something that we've just got, and so you'll see examples basically, of, not of Vario per se basically, but fundamental surgery is an example we're working at. But this is the kind of okay. thing that you can get it's from really Vario. It's really important to understand that because Sorry. these mixed realities uh, PC driven, it means that we can actually have incredibly detailed original models of the things. You don't need to do special versioning for VR purposes. You can run the full-blown version. Um, and again, things are uh, occluding the world perfectly. You get the shadow casting there again. And now, again, with Ultra Leap, we can even interact with. Now, in this case, uh, you is bringing. Uh... So, certainly can speed up our heart transplants, don't you think? <laughs> um, uh, and, and so, one of the criticisms there's always been is about no haptic feedback. Um, that may or may not be an issue, but it's certainly the first thing that kind of comes to mind. Well, now these are basically having haptic feedback kind of built into them. And this has largely been done in the orthopedic world. You've got these controllers. The controllers may look like a syringe, and this is being taught how to do ultrasound-guided access or to go ahead and do, and I've, I've replaced a couple of knees, which I've never done before in my life. And you feel the drill. You feel it kind of moving in your hand. And when you look at the Vario, you can touch. You can wear these haptic gloves. In it's remarkable. It's as bad today as it's ever going to be. And it's pretty remarkable today. This is obviously only going to get better and better and better. And we want to be in the place where we're starting to evaluate how this is being applied you know, inside a place like Houston Methodist. Yeah, you can turn this one up too. And so not only that, it's about virtual learning. This is something, this is a joint project we've been doing with one of the uh, folks in town. Welcome to what could potentially become the mighty XR conference room. This application brings multiple people from multiple locations together, allowing a collective user experience where everyone can access the repository of videos, animations, 3D models, and more from the Methodist and Blossom Medical databases. This will ultimately be an application available from the Oculus Quest store. We have chosen the Oculus Quest 2 for our application because it is cordless, does not require a PC, and is extremely affordable at approximately $300. In the application, you can have up to 50 participants communicating inside the app. Let's begin the tour. Similar to logging into Zoom or WebEx, Dr. Lumsden logs into the VR room to meet with Mr. Bruce Blossom. 
going to move this forward just a little bit. Select on the main screen. These topics arrange. So what you see is all of the stuff we're talking about is starting to come together. Our video library we load into this room. Our 3D animations that we can create are all going to be loaded into this room. Next, let's teleport to the left. Outside the window, you will see the Houston Medical Center, and on the right, you can see where the Mighty Center is located. You will feel that you're on the 14th floor of a brand new tower that is... So let me show you one of the things that we've created. Movable. This animation is unique in that it was developed using real patient CT data with a variety of programs, including Materialized Mimics, Autodesk 3DS Max, Adobe Premiere, and Adobe After Effects. The model appears approximately five feet wide and five feet tall. Dr. Lumsden can pause the video as he and Mr. Blossom explore the 3D model. So again, this is not just an animation. This is your animation. CAT scan, segment out the stuff we're interested in, push it into the 3D Max, which is what the animators use. We can short circuit that time, because it's very expensive to make these, by giving them the raw data. We record everything in the operating room so they can follow exactly what the process is and make sure that the animation is correct. And this is a patient-specific animation that we can potentially go ahead and interact with. Uh, John Schultz is probably going to kill me because we haven't patented that either. So now let me kind of move over as we start closing this out because the other, the Mirren, so we've had Mighty, Mighty XR, Mirren, Mighty, it all located in Mighty. It's your playground. It's my laboratory. It's Tim's laboratory. It's your laboratory. And we encourage you all basically to access and to use it. I, I think one of the, uh, the great things about when you see people like Roberta and, and Dr. Pettigrew on a podium is this is very powerful. What I've always done is look to see where the hospital is going to be spending money. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, no conflict, no interest is basically what happens in most cases. And so a hospital spends huge amounts of money. We built a new tower. We built woodlands. We're buying, anyone tell me how many millions of dollars we spent at the Siemens Basic in doing that? Probably close to $200 million in imaging equipment. We take the approach that, yeah, we want this relationship. We have to have a commercial relationship. But we want much more than that. We want a relationship for innovation and education, and that's the opportunity to kind of get resources. And so the Siemens relationship is the kind of predicate example of what to think about. We did the same thing with Storch, the audiovisual integrators, is that we want personnel who can help knit this together, and we want dollars that we can allocate basically to, for research projects. Uh, and the same thing here with the robotics. We spend huge amounts of money on robotics. Dr. Boone comes from urology. They're the guys who really drove robotics. But now it's in GYN. Now it's, and these are the surgical robots. And people often think, when we talk about robotics, only of surgical robots. Well, it's way beyond that. I mean, the neurosurgeons have robots. There are robots down in our pathology department moving specimens around. We got security robots. We have snake robots, like catheter robots that sneak up through the blood vessels. We have all of that, OK? <clears throat> And I had a visit to the Hamlin Center in Imperial College, and they've created a center for medical robotics. And they've leveraged the fact that we, they have an engineering group that's immediately adjacent to this clinical group. And that's what we have to do, is we've got to figure out how we leverage the buying power of the hospital to get the attention of industry, to give us the resources, and then we have to hire the engineers who are going to work, basically, on the, the, the basic science side of that. And so we've called that Mirren. Stands for Methodist Institute for Robotics, Imaging, and Navigation. The way that this will work is by combining the imaging of the patient. For example, we had a catheter robot that we can take the order. We had this way of drawing a center line. We use that to measure the length of a graph that's going in there. But that is a glide path. It's a series of XYZ coordinates. And as long as I fuse that accurately on top of the patient, and program the robot, you can have hands-free navigation basically inside the human aorta. Now, what's the advantage of that? The advantage is that when you basically, typically the, the best interventionalist, when they're going to do a coronary angiogram, they take a catheter and they push it in through the groin and they navigate it to the coronary arteries. They don't navigate a damn thing. What they do is they have a series of interactions which take place between the catheter and the outer wall of the aorta. It goes bump, 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 all the way over there. 
And if you ever look at the inside of some of these aortas, they are the nastiest looking thing. You can't even imagine that that's the inside of a blood vessel. And that wall interaction is what causes strokes. We don't get complications from navigating center line. You get, you get complications from the devices bumping into the wall of the blood vessel. And so a huge potential transformation is if we can basically not have these kind of wall interactions taking place. And so Stuart Core's kind of taken on this. Dr. Shostman's very supportive of it. We want to build the Hamlin Institute over here. We can't do it really without people like you being involved. So this is a little promo video we did. It gives you an idea. Can we talk? That's a two and a half million dollar robot, by the way. One of the guys who started Intuitive Surgical was an aerospace engineer trained at Rice. Uh, his name's Dan Wallace, and he partnered with um, Fred Moll, and he put together that company. Um, and that is worth a fortune. Uh, and so he started at Rice, wanted to work at NASA, ended up in the Bay Area, and now basically is involved in a series. Follow the people. These inventors are serially successful. You don't want to follow guys who are not serially successful, but by and they're not always successful, but by and large, these people essentially know how to do it and to evaluate the ability to create products. So we had the first robotic symposium. We're interested basically in partnering with many different device companies that are in there. These are just basically a few examples of the companies that are actively involved in this. And we want, we're very interested in students who are interested in robotics. And it's not just robotics, it's the imaging part. The visualization, the XR, you know, is part, basically, and parcel of this. Uh, the 3D stereoscopic vision that's important has now been built into some of these robots. This is where the innovation is going to occur, in, you know, in the future of surgery. And we are highly interested in how that actually happens. Uh, these are examples. Stuart can tell you a little bit more about this, is how we use MIDI to test new ideas and then basically get these STIR grants basically moving forward. And they're basically yeah, now into the second round of funding. So I'm going to, I'm going to put you in the operating room, you know, if, if this link works appropriately, you know, along with me. And this is another aspect of immersive education uh, that we're going to try out and see if it works. Millimeter VBX so, stent into this. So you're in my operating room. We film this. We record everything. And we film in this in 360. Okay. And so what you're looking at is that big screen up above me doesn't exist. And I'm driving this now, okay. You want to see what the nurse is doing. There's what the nurse is doing. Uh, the lights are off because we usually do this in the dark. We can see around this entire room. You can look at the roof if you want. We can enhance the visualization by putting this as a screen from 2D that you can put into this 3D. And this is very powerful in terms of basically being able to show people uh, and for team training they see going on in the operating room. So this is my laboratory. And the laboratory by which we can work on a daily basis move clinical trials through, walk next door, and be involved in very basic elements that are going on in MITEI. And so I want to close and leave some time basically for questions. I think we need to go from thinking this is theirs to thinking this is ours. I don't own MITEI. I don't own a Methodist. Well, maybe I own Methodist. Um, but I, I, and, and it's fundamentally important that we take it from the vision that has been set by our upper level leadership to making it work. And that is the hard part of this. It's about, you know, being willing to kind of bear yourself. I'll tell you if I have no idea what you're talking about, and that's what you need to be able to say, is that, um, Dr. Lumsden, I don't understand what you're saying. Boil it down for me. And email us, call us. I can tell you there's not a faculty member that I know would not basically give the right arm, after your surgeon, probably your left arm, to be able to work with some of the up and coming people in the bright minds like you've got. So thank you very much again for your attention and happy to take some questions. <laughs> yeah.